All right. Here we go. So the recording in progress means um, within the next couple of moments, people are going to start showing up. I always love to see that. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably the only person, <laughs> maybe you and me, Cameron, are the only two people who get excited when you see the number of participants climb climb up there. It just uh, it, it makes me feel excited that people are engaged. Um, I am especially excited, and for those of you who are joining us from uh, the outside world, um, whether you're in um, the rainy Bay Area, uh, it's, well, it's going to be rainy if it's not raining. Is it raining where you are, Cameron? It, it's, it's off and on, but right now it's, it's off, but it's been raining all night. Actually, yeah. no, I take it back. It is raining. It's a there, slight sprinkle, which is There you go. Amazing. Well, needless to say, we need water. We need water because, A, we need water, and we need water because um, we're in a drought. So uh, even though it may be unfortunate for, uh, for, for some people, I think everybody here is, is generally genuinely excited and um, if one could be um, anxiously anticipating an atmospheric river coming in from Hawaii, um, I am anxiously anticipating an atmospheric river. Um, do let us know as you're coming in from parts outside of the Bay Area or even within the Bay Area as your rain may be different than that of myself and Cameron, where you're coming in from, um, what the weather is like, where you are, uh, use that chat feature. That's what the chat feature is for. We'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, we'll talk about uh, Q&A and all that good stuff. And I can't tell you how um, personally excited I am for this session today. It's very different than um, your classic BevCon session. Um, it's gonna be very um, free flowing. It's going to be very deep, uh, if I can sort of jump into that ahead of time. Lots of interesting metaphors and parallels in life uh, that we can talk about and um, a session that I, I, I think is gonna be um, just cool. I've been really personally looking forward to this a lot. So, great. Um, people are still coming in. I think we could just time? go straight into the housekeeping and we'll- Can we go into housekeeping? Yeah. You wanna do that? You wanna jump yeah. on in and do housekeeping? Okay. Well, let's do that. Let me make sure my clicker works. Great. Well, for those of you who are coming in, and I, I know people buzz in at different times, and some people I know consciously make an effort to skip Evan's housekeeping slides. I know that. I've learned that over the years. But nevertheless, for those of you who are here with us today, a little bit of housekeeping for you. Number one, um, this is different than a regular BevCon. So rather than saying open and pour your wines, plural, already, I'm going to tell you to open and pour your wine um, and get a good glass of it on side. We're going to need it. It's good for social lubrication. It's good for a number of other things. But this is the first and only time during BevCon that you're going to need a corkscrew. Um, we're not working with our Master of the World uh, partner uh, kits today. This is just a nice bottle of extraordinarily delicious Chardonnay, which Cameron will walk us through in a couple of minutes. And um, it needs air too, and it will get better in the glass as, uh, as all great wines do. As a reminder, um, question and answer, and I think there should be and will be a lot of questions in this uh, particular session, perhaps more so uh, than in other sessions, will be answered live um, as we uh, finish our dialogue towards the end. We may will uh, uh, moderate the Q&A that's actually in the Q&A chat box, chat box. And then we will bring people in uh, to participate in the Brady Bunch format and engage with all of us and answer and ask questions of Cameron and or myself, please use the chat box for chatting. Um, and if you do want other people besides Cameron, myself, and Li Meng to see the comments, please make sure you select everyone because if not, it's just going to default to all of us. Um, a recording of this session and all other sessions will be available uh, via the classic bit.ly link, which we'll do uh, afterwards, both in the recap and that you received in the overview when you got your opening email from us. And please, please, please um, complete your um, survey afterwards. This is really important for our sponsors feedback. This is a, also a brand new um, session format for us. So I'm in particular, um, particularly curious to hear how, how you liked it. Do you want to see more like this in the, in the future moving forward? The survey is available at our bit.ly bit.ly, I don't even know, how do you pronounce that, Lee Ming? Bit.ly. Bit.ly uh, slash DM underscore eval, okay? So um, I think that's really all I want to say from a housekeeping standpoint. Um, so let's go.
this is a different format, as you can see. Um, and it's more like inside the winemaker studio or inside the actor studio, for those of you who can appreciate the soft analogy uh, within this. And um, in doing so, it's going to be very free flowing. It's going to be very dialogue y. I get to play James Lipton today, something I'm always very excited about doing. And Cameron, well, you get to play yourself, Cameron, in your, in your interviewee role and all that. As I said earlier, uh, for those of you who are just joining us, we have one wine. It's in a 750 milliliter bottle. It is this absolutely outstanding bottle of Richie Vineyard Chardonnay. And Cameron will actually talk about the wine um, specifically in a little, uh, a couple of minutes. But I'd encourage you if you haven't done so already to um, open that bottle up, pour yourself a nice glass of it. Um, I'm so excited that I didn't even bring a spit cup to this session, Cameron. I'm just gonna drink. I, I enjoy this wine and I'm enjoying the dialogue. And that's really what it's gonna be all about. So what I thought we would do before we actually jump into the material and everything, um, and in, in a classic James Lipton moment, Cameron, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I'm always going to start. Where are you from? So, where are you from? Tell us a little bit about your uh, your background, where you grew up, all that other good stuff. Yeah, so um, born and raised in uh, Lodi, California, uh, called the uh, the Zinfandel capital of the world. Um, small kind of rural town, but. Um, Vineyards always were in my world. Um, uncle owned a winery. Uh, there was always wine around the, uh, the din dining table. So, so yeah, it was, um, you know, not, it wasn't obvious, but it was definitely at the subconscious level. Uh, um, yeah. So how did you take subconscious and make it conscious? I mean, was there, was it because of the family element of it? Was there an aha moment that you had where you forced to go pick grapes in uh, as a teenager and all of a sudden you said I'd like to do this when when did you have this sense that this was something more than just part of the family upbringing if you will well it wasn't until actually my first semester in college to be honest the um I was actually a chemistry major in my first semester and uh got straight A's in all my chemistry classes I was like helping the pre-med students but calculus crushed me couldn't handle <laughs> chapter five applied integrals good luck with that buddy uh, fortunately, I was at Fresno State, had a great winemaking program and uh, some really uh, dynamic professors. And I walked in um, as a chemistry major and I walked out of that uh, building as an enology major uh, and, and never, ever looked back. I mean, and it was a big, you know, when you're when you're only 19 years old or 20 and you pick the, the take the decision to be a winemaker, um, and everybody's telling you, oh, you've got to stick with business, you know, stick with a broader, you know, perspective because you never know what you're going to be in. Uh, it's, it's a scary step. But um, the beauty of it is I could like focus on exactly what I knew I was going to be when I grew up. Mm -hmm. So it's it a great. Yeah. And, and I guess I would have to ask you, you know, was the, the, the Fresno State, um, did, was there an analogy sort of in your subconscious there when you made that selection for, for second, you know, for your, for your uh, college education? Did it just happen to be serendipitous? Um, what, what's what you're thinking there? I mean, what could you it share? It was with totally, you? I, you know, as soon as I, as soon as everybody back home in Lodi found out I'd done this, there was, there was like enormous, like support and applause. And so, so I definitely got a little bit of a, a gentle nudge uh, in more ways than one, I guess you might say, once uh, once I changed majors. Um, but yeah, my uncle, my family, everybody was like, yes, this is going to be, this is a great decision for you. So um, so yeah, it was a little serendipitous, but I think maybe it was, maybe it was destined. It, it's, yeah. Actually, and um, I'm just looking through um, your, your bio here, and I noticed it's at, at one point, um, gosh, a couple at the beginning of uh, the, the aughts, if you will, you and your wife went off to, uh, to, to Italy and you worked and spent some time in Puglia. How did that, how did that shape this journey or was that just sort of an interesting add on to what you were doing? Was there any aha moment that being outside the country brought you in uh, terms of perspective? Well, I was, you know, once I graduated from, from college, I was one of those students that went right into work. I did not take any free time. No gap year wasn't even my vocabulary. So uh, I didn't, I didn't get to have any fun after school. And, and so, you know, after working 10 years in, in, in the industry, I worked for Mondavi for five and then Gallo Sonoma for about six years. And then I'm like, wow, you know, it's time. And so I sold my house as I was 33 years old which is, you know, I hear is your, your Christ year, meaning everything's supposed to change. 
So I sold my house, I got engaged, quit my job and moved to Italy and connected with um, uh, a winery called Casa Girelli, uh, owner's named Stefano. And he had a couple, two or three wineries that he sourced, he made wine at in, in Southern and Northern Italy. And I ended up in Puglia in the deep South in the heel uh, making Primitivo and Lambrusca and Negro Mata uh, and some Chardonnay. Actually, one of the reasons why they hired me is because they wanted to incorporate a little bit of, you know, Chard Shishi, Cala, Chardonnay Shishiness into their, their wine program. And so, so yeah, what is that? They're, I'm like, well, we got to buy some barrels. We got to start playing around with natural yeast. And they were like, Whoa, they, they kind of, kind of blew their mind away. But um, um but yeah, I got, but the fun, the great part about it is I got to actually take, take some of my experience with me and actually make wine the way I know how to make wine. It wasn't like an intern there that was just sort of uh, directed to fill barrels or clean tanks or wash the floor. It's like I actually got an opportunity to do something, you know, and contribute um, because of my experience. Absolutely. And then lastly, before we jump in, um, you, you talk about so many of these choices and we're going to talk a lot about choice and we're going to talk a lot about choice and intent within choice is the uh, sort of focal point of this session today. Was there, you know, being in Italy, be it prior, you know, you, you talk about being a contributor rather than just like to your point, cleaning tank and schlepping, schlepping hoses around and stuff like that. What was, was there an aha moment? Was there an aha bottle of wine uh, that you had that made you really say, this is the right direction for me. I am on the right path. I want to do this. Yeah, I mean, in. You know, <laughs> actually, the day I got to Italy, um, nobody spoke English. Uh, uh, very rustic, very rustic. Um, I literally cried, thought this is the worst decision I've ever made in my life. I need to go home. I need to get out of here. This is this is way out of my comfort zone. And um, I don't know if it was really the wine itself, but it was the passion and, and, and the zest of, of, of just being and living mm. and, and the people that I worked with making wine, they were so like just genuine and, and you know, there was nothing really, there was nothing, there's no secrets, there's nothing hidden. And I just really, I really connected. Um, and I, I had to, you had to like, I had to, every fiber of my body, I just had to like get up and, and and it was hard work from every waking moment was hard work. I mean, right. you know, you, you got to speak Italian. You've got to learn, you know, you know, the English system is out, you know, all, all uh, you know, milliliters and hectares and, 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 uh, and, you know, kilos, everything, all the weights and measures were totally different. Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And, and I think. And, and pushing and pushing that, through that. Um, completing that, that validation. Yeah. It, basically said, okay, I can pretty much do anything in winemaking that I put my mind to. So, so yeah, that was a, that was a deal. That was the deal. That was when it all happened. I think it's interesting, you know, going through um, that catharsis, if you will, of, of that moment when you literally, uh, you know, we, I think we've all been through it, you know, that we're going to now bring ourselves into the thing about, uh, about growth and rearing and all of that and how that plays a role in that. But I think we've all been in those moments where we feel like, oh my God, I can't push through this or, oh my God, I made a bad call or, oh my God, this is going to be awful or whatever. And it is surmounting challenges and difficulty, pushing through, having the confidence in yourself and the experience, obviously having made wine before that you can do this and things can happen. So thank you for this background here. And let's just jump into the topic. For those of you who, who um, Remember what the title slide said at the very, very beginning, uh, or the topic of all this, you know, it's, it's um, Wines of Intent, you know, Zen and the Art of, of, of raising, uh, raising Children, or if you will. And I think that the parallels of winemaking and parenting are, are, much more, um, are much more important than people necessarily think about at surface level. Now, whether you are a parent, if you are a parent, you know, a lot of this stuff is going to, you're going to be nodding your head. But even if you're not a parent, you were parented by somebody at some point in time. So you can you can look look from either top down or bottom up and have a lot of these things um, relate to you. But, you know, I always have told people over the years as, you know, I've got a couple of kids myself that, you know, just because you're a parent doesn't mean you're necessarily rearing your children well, because there is, I always tell people there's a difference. There's parenting 
And then there's bringing up, rearing, and raising children. And they're two very different things. Or it's literally night and day. And the outcomes of same are both different in the short term and in the long term for everybody concerned. Because parenting, and I, I do draw a differentiation, is really what the vast majority of, of parents uh, do and have been doing for, you know, some, God, 50 years or whatever. And it's constituted by the fact that, you know, it's a very um, child-centric thing, paying ridiculous, inordinate, I mean, the world centering around them, you know, fawning attention, being so constantly child oriented, and behaving in such a way that everything revolves around them, um, that it can be overly protective, it can be overly done, um, especially if you only do it in a what we call the helicoptering mode. But by contrast, you know, the rearing or raising of a child, is you know the equivalent of like lifting a youngster out of childhood and helping them become um, a happy, healthy young adult, and focusing in on their character and their achievement, and help helping them to mold themselves through us into sort of an emotionally young person who's driven by rational, responsible, being resilient, being self-controlled, and that that when we do this um, and we allow them to experience frustration. And we allow them to fail, if you will, and experience hardship um, in life and in the vineyard. That's important because, you know, just because you're a winemaker doesn't necessarily mean you're making and creating great wines. And we're certainly all um, experienced in having a wine that's a sound wine or it's a wine, but is it a great wine? Is it a wine that showed care? Is it a wine that showed intent? So the entire um, aegis, the entire um, totality of what this seminar is going to be about um, for the next, you know, uh, you know, roughly hour, and then we're going to open up in the Q and A, and I know this will be a lot of Q and A. Is exploring the parallels, exploring, if you will, um, being born or the birth of one's child, and raising that, uh, rearing that individual into a happy, healthy person, and the parallel of that with wine. We all are familiar with people talking about wines as their children. We probably heard it a million times before, but there's a lot more truth to it, I think, than what we sort of cursorily throw on it. And, and we're going to talk with Cameron here um, and his experiences um, at Ramey over close to two decades now, prior to that, his own experience, his own philosophies, and how literally from um, the, if you will, birth uh, the picking of the grapes, even maybe the preconception, the planning of the vineyard, the thinking about your vineyards and all that, the fermentation of a wine, overseeing its élevage, and ultimately putting it out into the world. So let's talk about that. You know, we know in the stages of life, you know, there's babies, there's toddlers, there's you know a little child. Um, they turn into a tween. We all we all know that. We all remember doing that. Although they didn't call it tweens back then, we didn't know exactly what it was. Obviously, there's adolescents and teenagers. There's young adults, uh, and then of course you become an adult. Um, and in the case of wine, you know we go from grapes uh, to must to new wines, uh, developing wines, maturing wines, and of course mature wines themselves. So, so our focus today is going to be looking at those processes and looking at them through the prism of the choices we are faced with. Um, the intent by which we make the decisions. And I'm not going to put on my psychology hat and talk to you about um, raising kids and anything, but nevertheless, as Cameron, as a father, myself as a, as a father, I think there'll be some times where we sort of throw it in and bring a real life analogy uh, into that because it's appropriate and germane in the discussion of um, the stages of life of a wine. So before we do that, I want to be, uh, you know, got to have a good a, a prop, if you will. This isn't even a prop. It's a shame to call that. But we have a wine in front of us. This is the final wine. This is a very healthy, successful um, young adult and the uh, 2018 Ramey Ritchie Vineyard Chardonnay. Why don't you tell us about this wine? Then we'll delve into our dialogue. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, actually, I, I have been waiting for this moment to pour my glass of wine. It's uh, it's early in the morning here in, in, in rainy California. But, um, you know, honestly, we, when we do our tastings, we usually taste around 11 o'clock every day because that's when you're, as you guys know, this is when your palace of fresh is so, so um, first of all, cheers, um, Evan, thank you and the rest of your, your group for putting this on, <laughs> you know, cheers first to everybody out there in Zoom land as well, too, we hope you're all raising yeah, your glasses. You know, I, I'll just real, real quick, Evan called and told me his concept of, of doing this parental, you know, 
winemaking comparison. And, and at first I'm, I'm like, wow, this is, this is, this is definitely out of the box. And I've been thinking, I think this might have the material to be like its own Netflix, uh, you know, reality show. <laughs> there you go. You can take somebody through a whole vintage and you and I can lead them through. And I like that. Lee yeah. Bang, let's remember to call the Netflix people later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, so yeah, so we are um, starting with the, uh, our Richie Chardonnay. This is our 2018 um, Richie. We've been making the, the, 18, the Richie Chardonnay uh, from the same block uh, since 2002. So this is one of our, um, one of our, our, our single vineyards that we're probably one of the more fond of, as fond of as any one of our other, other uh, vineyards. Um, the vineyard's located right in the heart of Russian River Valley. It's owned by a, a farmer uh, who planted the vines in 1978. His name's Kent Ritchie. Uh, he's got, um, you know, he, he just knew, he knew the soil. The soil's, uh, for the most part, is, is Gold Ridge loam. Um, but as we always know, uh, the uh, climate trumps pretty much everything. So location, location is key here. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, this wine, yeah, it's native yeast. It's got some great notes here for you. Uh, it's all uh, native malact bacteria, 100% uh, barrel fermented. Um, when I first started, I've been working with, with Ramey for about 20 years now. And, and honestly, I, you know, we started at about 40 to 50% new French oak. Um, and then now we're down to around 20%. You know, it's just, I think stylistically and climate wise, we're learning that this wine really um, <clears throat> has, has this better balance now with a little bit less new oak. Still, we're still using the same Coopers, Francois Frere and, um, and Terenceau. Terenceau just started making a new, a new uh, burgundy barrel called the, um, called the Pure Tea, which has been a, a great asset to our, our uh, portfolio in terms of wood. Um, yeah, and then, and then the, other, the other important part that we could talk about more later is, is the, the clonal selection. We're using an old Winthy selection. So we're talking about uh, a clone that yields, um, or a fruit that is very, very small berries. Um, so you get a uh, very, very um, high skin uh, juice to, to uh, skin ratio. And all the, all the flavors and the aromatics in, are in the skin. So when you have more skin, of course, everything else is going to be elevated. So your, your, your aromatics, your flavors, your, your textures are all going to be intensified. Mm -hmm. um, and then let's see. Yeah, we've been working with the same block since 2002. So yeah, Evan's got, he's got the, all the notes are dialed we, in there. We try. And, and obviously when you received your bottle, um, as I did, you got the uh, full on tech sheet there. So if you want to review anything later, that's there. But I think what'll be interesting as we talk about this and as we go through the processes, you've been making this wine for a long time and working with the same fruit for a long time. How, how, have, the, how have you reacted over the years? Have you parented slightly different perhaps or not? Um, you know, you, you spoke of oak and your, your changing philosophy Good. there. Um, and we'll talk yeah. about that. So let's let's bring it on. Let's let's talk about the so-called early years. Let's talk about the birth, if you will. We all are familiar with giving birth, and that's Mother Nature, and that's harvest. And obviously, if you can give us a snapshot of what you're seeing in 2021 as we go through this, that'll be great. But clearly, um, let's start with the grapes. Uh, caring for picking. Um, what are talk to us about some of the decisions. Um, that, that have to be made and the choices you make and the intent of them when you're going through this process and even perhaps beforehand as, as the, the grapes are, are coming up are, are going through verasion and all that because obviously if you don't have great grapes, you're not gonna have a healthy child. Yeah, and, and you know, the reason why uh, 2021 was such a great vintage, or the reason why we had, one of the one of the most important parts about why a great vintage is a great vintage is because I look out this window and I see it's raining and it's, 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 we're still kind of in the middle of October. And, um, this was a very early harvest and 99% of it has happened. So it's pretty much over. A lot of times what happens in, in the challenging vintages is the weather sort of dictates or has a, has a pretty profound impact on your picking decision. You know, you, if, if, if you see a storm coming in or you see a, a big heat waving in, heat wave coming in, you might, you might, you know, tend to pull the trigger and, and pick those grapes. Or if they're not even close, you might just weather the storm, so to speak, or, you know, go get, try to just deal with the heat wave. 
And so this harvest, the weather was perfect. We did not have to make a single move because of the weather. Mother Nature was on board this year. And so I think that's probably one of the most important factors um, in, in establishing a great vintage. Now, there's always things like droughts, um, which this year was, a, was a, a challenge for a few vineyards, um, uh, particularly with um, some that are, you know, they don't have really deep wells. They, de they, they um, depend on um, runoff water in their, in their lakes and their reservoirs. So those, yeah, those ran dry. And some of the farmers had to truck in water uh, to keep things going. And that's really not, you know, that is not um, uh, sustainable and it's not ideal. And, and so, yeah, so there, there was some, some little, little nuances here and there that I think we had to work through, but, but I think the weather, once again, I go back to the great weather we had and it, it really cooperated. It made picking easy. It made caring for the grapes. It made, it made the rearing of these children um, very, very easy. And yeah. so, uh, or at least the, the onset, you know, who, I, you know, we still have a lots, lots of winemaking ahead of us on this vintage, but I can tell you uh, where we stand now, we are in extremely good shape. Yeah, but, but, but it is interesting too, because again, I'll, I'll drag it back there. I mean, ha having, um, you know, uh, a, um, uh, a seamless pregnancy, if you will, no problems in delivery, all of those things are so important at the inception, um, especially, you know, as an experienced parent, in your case, literally multiple vintages behind you, you're probably a, um, a little bit more adept and a little bit more confident in dealing with what mother nature throws at you because you've been there, you've done that, you've seen it. But for a younger winemaker who may be coming out of school and initial harvest and facing adversity and weather um, is going to set them up for pre pre-stage, um, all of that as well too. And then um, with respect just to, you know, again, you, your, your child's been, birth, you're in the process of active birthing, picking anything that, you know, maybe use this year as again, a, um, uh, a canvas for what we're discussing. Thoughts about picking grapes and sampling and anything that, that you think are important choices um, that, you, that you make and maybe that have evolved over time. Yeah, you know, there's, and so the, the I'll, I'll, I'll add, so the feeling that, one of the greatest feelings, this is hard, it's so hard to explain, but the first day of harvest, when the, when the press is spotless, the stemmer is you know, crystal, you know, beautifully clean, the floors are clean, all the tanks are empty, and the grape truck arrives, and, and you can hear his truck pull up, and the brakes just kind of squeak to a stop, and you start you pulling the straps off, you get on the forklift, you start pulling the bends out. And it's like, you really get, I mean, it, honestly, you get this feeling, it's like, ah, it's a new beginning. It's like, now I get to mold something that I get to, I get to start over. You get, it's like blank canvas. And, you know, it's kind of like, it's, it's I, I get, you know, okay, so this is my 30th vintage. So if I had a kid, every vintage, I'd had 30 kids. And, you know, each one is definitely a little bit different. Um, but, you know, there's, I guess there's some things in, at, at this part that just give you this, this really, um, like the, the odd, the, everything's even now. So mm -hmm. the odds are even and, and the decisions of, of um, what you're going to do at that point are sort of, you know, there's fundam there's two parts, there's two parts of why make there's fundamental stuff that um, you know, you are going to happen. And then there's little nuances and there's forks in the road that you decide to travel on. I mean, one of the things I tell people is that, you know, the, the French have been making wine for a thousand years and, um, you know, they got a pretty good system and we, we, we've sort of kind of are in, on, on, on the, uh, the idea that it works really well. Don't try to fix them. It isn't broke. So, you know, the whole cluster press, the natural yeast, the full mallow, the barrel fermentation, um, the, uh, you know, unfiltered, we don't, we don't own a filter, uh, the, you know, the 12 month for some, for the village wines, it elevage for 18 for the, the single vineyard wine. So there's a system there that has been perfected. Um, now we're not trying to make a, a white burgundy. So, you know, there's no, there's no coincidence that you look at our label. That's hard to see that it's, uh, it's sort of an old world appeal to it. It's got a crest, it's got the shoulder label um, because you know, we're, 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 it sort of reflects the respect we have for our, 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 um, 
our friends who've been making wine since you know the Roman times. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's important to, to, to understand that. Now we're not now we're not trying to make a white burgundy. We can't. We're in California, so you know we're capitalizing on on Chardonnay. It's grown in this amazing sunshine, but we're just using the the methodology that the that, that's been around for mm -hmm. for 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 you know hundreds of years. The two together, I think, is a great a great bind, a great, a great uh, marriage, so to speak. And right. now sometimes I call our, this our Richie Chardonnay or all of our Chardonnay is sort of a, a neo-Burgundian, you know, bringing these two worlds together. So, so it's an interesting analogy. And again, I'll always play the other, the, the other side of our, our discussion here. So when you're, when you know, you're going to be a parent you probably go out there and you buy, you know, back in my generation, you buy the Dr. Spock book. I'm sure there's other doctors these days who have written books there and um, they've got lots of experience. Um, their advice is solid and sound by and large. Obviously, you have to make your own um, decisions because to your point, Burgundy is not California. And so not everything is going to be purely adaptive in that way. But talk about some of these early um, choices in your own experiences, but whether it's, you know, to your point, um, the choice of Oaks or Coopers or Toasts. Um, you know, your choice of going native with your fermentation as opposed to inoculation. Have you adjusted your temperatures um, along the way? The entire environment um, that, that, that you're, you're producing in, which is, again, essentially those early years of, of, of childhood, setting your kid up to then go off to batonage racking basic tasting regiments, which would be like the equivalent of, you know, I don't know, nursery school to grammar school. I, talk to us a little bit about that and some of the, ch the, the decisions that you've made and why um, you've made those decisions, whether they be recent or whether they be things that you started literally some 30 years ago that you're still doing today because they work. Yeah, well, th there's some both. Some things we're still doing. Some things were sort of modified. But yeah, I think that the first thing is, is so that you, you see the grapes, the grapes arrive, and then you've got to decide Okay, that sort of I was talking about that kind of helps you uh, direct you in one 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 fork or the other fork in the road, whichever it may be. But you know, red grapes, of course, those go in a tank with the skins and all. Uh, Chardonnay goes direct to press. You've got Sau Blanc, um, those going to go into a stainless steel drum, for instance. You also have we have a couple. Uh, I'll take you for a quick tour later. Hopefully, if we have time, we have a couple of concrete eggs where. We've um, we put some Chardonnay that we want to really capture that that real um, that real lacy kind of minerality. Um, there's you know the vessel is sort of there as an option. You know it's kind of like do you put your your kids in a in the crib right away or do you let them sleep in your bedroom and in, in, in your bed or or how do you you know you got to feed off their personality and and really um, and see what what their what the right environment is. But the most important part is you got to create you know, uh, sort of a nurturing, a, um, a safe and uh, healthy uh, uh, environment. And so, so that also has to do with, like you said, like temperature. So, so all of our, our red fermentations, we ferment at 72 degrees. And it's a lot like everybody, you know, a human being, to be honest, we, uh, we like our 68 to 72 degrees. So do yeast, yeast love, even love that kind of temperature. Um, as well as um, as the malactic, you know, we nice, we like to keep that warm, even though it's all indig indigenous and um, in the yeast are, or they're all natural, um, they still are very similar to the commercial yeast. Everything likes likes that certain warm temperature. Um, is also you got to create, um, you know, your 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 kids. You got to feed your kids, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you got to keep them alive. There's certain these are the fundamental thing. Uh, we have, have to add a little bit of supplement to each fermentation. There's not enough nitrogen and micronutrients in, um, in, in red wine or white wine making uh, to just let it go. So we add just a little bit of nitrogen and, and um, right at about 18 bricks, whether it's red or white. And then, and the other important part, okay, and here's, here's, here's an interesting part is, is there's a, you know, vaccination has been a, has been a very, um, it's all brought, brought to our forefront. Uh, recently, of course, but but sulfur dioxide, SO2 is kind of like a like a subtle amount. It's kind of like a young early vaccination, and mm -hmm. and we do add a little tiny bit of sulfur right at the onset of making Chardonnay as well as, as red wine, and and that kind of keeps all the all the all the the bacteria and the and the yeast that we don't want to get involved 
in the process of in the in the production in the fermentation. So, so it's sort of like a you know you got to keep them healthy. You got to feed them nice mm -hmm. environment, but you got to keep them healthy and 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 um, uh, and happy. I love that. I, I and I love the way you refer to um, that that sort of very judicious use of uh, a sulfur as a vaccination. I mean, very timely given everything we're dealing with right now. But I think to your point, providing feeding and providing this nurturing um, environment where the kids are getting their shots and they're being, you know, a healthy diet and all of that, you're setting them up. So when you go into those early stations of élevage, when you send them off to nursery school or, or, or grammar school or kindergarten or whatever it is, that they're really, you know, it's gonna be formative years you know, batonage and backings and all these other things, but, and, there, and there's going to be choices, you know, some kids go to immersion schools, you know, uh, Chinese school or Spanish immersion school, some go to traditional French schools, whatever, all of again are choices. What sort of, as you're looking at different lots or different grapes or whatever, what sort of determine your philosophies towards more or less Botanage, more or less racking. What are your tasting regimens? Do you do you adjust in in process? Talk to us a little bit about the so-called early stages. Well, you know, a lot of my every day during this time of the year, things are fermenting. There is like big, big, big changes are happening with the wine, the tasting and the smelling, uh, and, the, and the sensory and the sensory. Um, you know, analytics are probably more important than the than the numbers because you can smell something or taste something or see something much well, well before you can actually analyze it. So, so every morning before, uh, right after our meeting, sometimes before we have a morning meeting, I'll go and I'll I'll stick my head in in right in the top of each tank and I'll just get a smell and see if it smells healthy or not. And you can smell that little change like every day and it's kind of like so here's the, the analogy i got is when you're having when your kids are are, are are young and they're in diapers sometimes you gotta do a little smell check right to know if you need to like change the diaper <laughs> and so yeah it's just kind of like uh that's that's it, it, it's definitely a a factor um so that, some kids toilet train quicker than others right so yeah yeah exactly and and sometimes you need to intervene mm -hmm. and sometimes you can just let it ride and <laughs> so uh so yeah it, it's um it's 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 yeah what, what yeah it's funny where, where you need to intervene um so yeah and then we're tasting daily and you know as far as as far as uh at that stage we're doing like qc we're just making sure things are healthy um, we're making sure that they're on the right track. It's really not until, you know, probably at the end of fermentation where we're like, we can really look at the wine and say, wow, this is, this turned out really amazing. This is something that is going to be in our single vineyard program or one of our, our we have make an Annum blend, which is a proprietary blend of various, uh, vineyards that we really like. Um, and so, yeah, we might, we might, we might do a little more stirring we might um you know it really has to do with blending i guess at that point so um so yeah there's there's certain things that are kind of preset but but you know right now we're just sort of like doing our, our qc and making sure things are right on track yeah and it's and it's interesting again to to use the thing we've been talking about you know as a as a, as a parent you know you're 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 more physically actively involved earlier and as, as the child ages, your role moves from one of sort of being owner, if you will, to more of like a general manager, a general manager to a consultant, a consultant to ultimately a project consultant, and then, you know, to an, to an advisor over time. And as a wine grows up, um, you know, and, and the wine tells you a lot about what it wants to be, you know, in terms of do I want more batonage or not? Do I want to do these things? Um, your role uh, obviously um, changes with it too. So let's 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 talk and moving through. You know, now now we're we're getting into these stages where the wine, um, if you will, has has equal say or more say perhaps in its own development than you sort of making all of these calls for it. So let's call this the tweening. Let's call it the teening, the young adulthood here. So we're dealing with issues of ongoing élevage. To your point, um, tasting trials. You know, do you back off the batonage or increase it? Are we racking? How are we topping off? Um, 
you know, to then more of the trial blending that going from the tweening into the teening and then readying uh, that wine out there. Walk us a little bit through um, some of these choices and we'll, we'll stop um, at, at, towards the end here when we get to the, the finishing readying because that's like literally sending your, 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 um, your beloved right. out to the world. But let's talk about some of these tweening, teening decisions. Yeah, so, so this is, you know, another exciting point, but also, a, a, you know, a milestone, I guess you might call it. And I, um, I mean, now that you've, you, you know, the variety, you know, you know, that certain varieties thrive in different, different vessels, uh, and you've got that all figured out. And now the point where your wine really when, when, when things turn into that, that they make that turn is through malolactic fermentation. So we, all the alcohols turn, all the sugars turn into alcohol. Um, and now, Right about actually now, some some wines that we have made from this actual vintage uh, have started to go through malolactic fermentation. So they started going through that that tweening. Um, and I, I actually I, I did think a lot about what how does this relate to? Because I have kids that are 17 years old. Okay, just for the record, been making wine for 30 years. So I I, I think I I got a little bit of input here, but I think so. Um, uh, this whole malolactic fermentation thing. There's, there's, there's basically, there's basically two important reasons why uh, Chardonnay and red wines uh, go through malolactic. And number one, it changes the acid profile so that it's not so hard and, and abrasive, but a little bit softer, a little bit rounder. But it also, it also stabilizes the wine. So in, in other words, you, you put your wine in a bottle and you ship it wherever it might go, you don't want it to go through malolactic. You want it to be as stable as possible. So, I mean, there's other reasons why you do it. There's oak integration, there's more complexity, but really it's, it's about those two, th those two things. I mean, the stability is probably one of, is probably, if not the, you know, one of the most important, maybe the most important process. But, but anyway, so, um, so during this process, you, the wine changes, so dramatically, I kind of align this with <laughs> with puberty. Okay, <laughs> so we got these teens, man. Their hormones are changing. Their voice is changing. They're like can't figure out which way to go. And the wine does go through a certain kind of odd stage. It's like, oh, you know what's going on? And you kind of have to. It's a bumpy road. Let mm -hmm. me tell you, when wines go through mallow, it could, you know, for for starters, it could take it could take about thirty days, but it could take a year. Some of our mm -hmm. Chardonnay won't finish mallow, haven't finished mallow until the, just before the following harvest. It's kind of a stressful time for a winemaker or a parent to get their kids to go through this time of life. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely a bumpy road, um, but it's very important if that's the style of wine you're making. And that is, uh, if you think that um, that's going to make them thrive the most. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting with, you know, I remember with my own kids growing up in the teenage years, you know, somebody once told me a very apt analogy that, 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 that teenage adolescence is a lot like a tunnel. They go into it and they'll come out of it. How long it takes will vary. And sometimes it's bumpier than other times. And sometimes it's quick and easy and all of that. And, and I do think that, you know, that, that, that going through those challenging times, be it in winemaking or beating parent is, is interesting. Do you find, or have you found in your, you know, your three decades of, of winemaking, Cameron, that, you know, do you, do you, do you listen to the, or, or view what's going on in front of you? And do you pull back? Do you adapt? What do you do? Um, in the case of using your malolactic um, metaphor here, would you, if it was going slow, would you maybe increase the heat in the cellar a little bit? Or, you know, what, are, are there adjustments that you will make by perception of what's going on that um, are not just like let it roll on, on red, but, you know, rather, you know, okay, I've seen this before, I've done this before, this is my experience, boom. So, so yeah, so one of the, you know, one of the things that I will make sure happens during this process is, is batonnage, stirring. And the reason why we don't want to miss a sequence of batonnage is because one of the byproducts of malolactic is, is diacetyl. That's the, the buttery compound that you, that sometimes you smell in, in Chardonnays. And you'll notice there's no buttery con there's no butteriness in our, our mm -hmm. smell in our wine. There's no diacetyl because diacetyl is an artifact. It's a, it's a compound that happens because of malolactic fermentation. It's not coming from the vineyard. It's not something that I, I, that 
is expressed because of the climate where these grapes are grown. I don't, I don't want some, I don't want that compound in my wine unless it comes from the vineyard. Okay, my, my job is basically to make the wine so it, 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 it reflects and it, it, it um, accentuates what is going on in that particular region in that vineyard. So, so how do you get rid of dacetyl? Well, you stir it because the yeast, the yeast that are still floating around, they have this enzyme called, you can guess, diacetyl reductase. And as what happens is you get something called, this is where David, tells me is he calls it diffusion kinetics and the yeast gets right up next to the this diacetyl compound and it breaks it down and it disappears so you don't you don't get that perception of, of buttery uh ness in 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 your wine now if you want to make a buttery wine pretty easy just don't stir it just rack the wine off those leaves throw the yeast away boom you got a buttery wine so so that's you know a, a really important part of um during this stage of mallow is to stir the wine. And, and frankly, we do the same thing with our red wines. We actually will keep the lees, which is a combination of yeast, but also um, there's some also organic, comp, you know, grape compounds in there, really light lees, but that we, we feel also helps with that. It's not as a big deal, the diacetyl, but it helps with mouthfeel and texture. But we stir our, we stir our Chardonnays weekly, um, all during malolactic fermentation, and then we'll stir our our, Pinot, our Pinots, um, same thing weekly. They usually go through malolactic very quickly. Um, and then the uh, Syrahs, we actually stir those um, eh, maybe every other week. And then Cabernets, a little bit less, about um, every every two weeks, every every once a month. Uh, so very, a very important, um, again, engagement and, and um, during uh, time, knowing when to intervene, knowing when you need to be there. I guess as we talk a little bit about trialing and blending and, and things like that, and I don't want to get into the other stuff. Um, I, 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 look, I look at this a lot as to as your, um, your adolescent gets older, starts becoming more of a young adult, if you will, you're giving them more rain, you're letting them screw up a little bit, but in a managed environment. But it's also this ongoing thing about communicating, you know, somebody, again, wiser than I once said that the best way to survive uh, this battle that we face in all of this is just make sure that the lines of communication are kept open, that you're ongoing having dialogue with that. And I, I would assume in winemaking, you know, wine's finished, ML's done, you know, you're, 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 you're trialing some ideas, you keep testing and trying the same wines to see how they're developing and all that. How do you, you know, is that, that's clearly not an overrated element of what we're doing. Talk about your level of interaction during this thing and how it may be less aggressive than before, but nevertheless is so important. Yeah, so so I kind of, now this I kind of compare. So we taste, we taste every single wine in the winery every other week. Okay, so for instance, say this week we're tasting all the white wines. Next week we're tasting all the red wines. So we kind of alternate, right? It's a, it's on the calendar, it's happening. I, if somebody's traveling in New York or they're, or they're sick, it doesn't matter. There's, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're gonna be tasting. We have a core group that sits down and goes through all this. And it's kind of like, it's a, it's, a, it's a really powerful way to, you start making the blends in your mind, right? Kind of virtually. And you know your appellations, you know which, which, which blends are gonna kind of evolve one way or the other. And it's a lot like sitting at the dinner table every night with your kids and saying, hey, how'd school go today? Now the answer is usually good. So <laughs> you never answer, you never ask a yes or no question. This is, you just, I, I've learned that, that's, that's taken me a long time to figure that out. So, so you always sort of, you gotta push yourself to kind of make these, 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 you know, these, um, I mean, in, in, in the winery, we, we, we push ourselves to think about different blends and, you know, we'll make a blend thinking like, ah, this'll, this'll never work, you know? And then once you get the wines together, it's like, aha, wow. It's honestly, that is a really nice blend that works great. So these trial blends are truly trials of not only, not only how the wine works, but you're experimenting at the same time. And, uh, it's very powerful, and and you don't you usually you usually don't do this blending until usually it's, it's definitely after mallow, 
Uh, it's usually for reds. We usually do this around February, March, so that we can actually go down in the cellar and put the and actually assemble them uh, sometime in, in hopefully June or before before July, before summer. Summer, this place is a ghost town. Everybody is on vacation, so we like to get these blends together. Uh, you know, spring or so, and then Chardonnays are are usually um, you know maybe a little earlier than that. But mm -hmm. but yeah, I think the the whole blending part is it's ongoing and. Uh, there's little tweaks and little little pushes that we might make later on, but the major, the big part of the blends and those decisions yeah. are made right around the springtime of the next year. And it's yeah, I, I love your metaphor of of the dining table because you're right. You know, how often is it that if you make a point of number one, insisting or or trying to make sure that as a family you stay together and have that that important meal um, once a day. But your question of, you know, how was your day today? How did things go? It may be good, in which case, you know, yeah, the wine's doing fine and everything. But every once in a while, you know, that that one word answer might end up being a two hour conversation yes. about something where you learn something more about what's going on there. And I think that, you know, as, as uh, either when one was raised or whether you are raising, not underestimate something that may be a little bit later in life. And, you know, you're, you're a young adult, you're doing these things and all that, but, but staying tethered and having those ongoing communications and conversations are critical. So let's, let's talk a little bit now, you know, you're finishing high school, you're getting ready, you're prepping, you're, 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 you're working with your, your young adults to send them off to the first time they're going to, they're going to eventually be on their own. They're going to be off at school or working or what it is. And we want to make sure that we've given them as much love and preparation and, um, and, 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 and before they head off to the house. So, you know, the whole process of bottling, um, I'd really like to spend some time around closure choice because God, you know, you can spend so much time and energy working to, to make sure your kid is doing all right. And then you want to make one bad, silly call at the end and they go spinning out of control and then resting your wines or giving them that time after you finish them. But before you actually send them out into the market, um, live release them, Talk to us a little bit about all of those um, those selections, those intentional choices. Yeah, so so bottling a wine is probably the most uh, treacherous, the most traumatizing experience a wine ever goes through. You're taking a big blend, you know, a couple thousand gallons, and you're you're cramming it into a, a gas 750 milliliter bottle, and then you then you you, you shove a, some kind of cork into it. It goes in a bottle, on a truck, warehouse, another truck, and then this is just the wine is is just completely traumatized. So it's it's really important to, to 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 really think about the choices you're making here, but for sure, because not only that, it's this is your last, this is it, you're done. This is your your last opportunity to have a final impact and a final say of how things progress from this point forward. Mm -hmm. So so really, you know, you're looking at. Um, you know, you're, 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 you're choosing the package. I mean, let me, I'll back up just real quick. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, just before bottling, we do sort of that clarification uh, part, you know, it's no, it's no, it's no uh, coincidence. Our wine looks pretty. It's got to look nice, you know, and the package has got to look nice too. There's, there, there's appearance is really important to us. And so we, we do find, we, we find our wines uh, with Chardonnay, we use Isinglass. Uh, casing bentonite, uh, red wines were used egg whites. And not, we, we don't do that to clarify, but also to help kind of bring back some of the fruitiness, to help kind of uh, polish some of those tannins mm -hmm. in the red wines. Um, but really that's that's kind of the start about, you know, letting, letting your wine know that it's gonna look nice, letting your kids know that it's important to look nice, it's important mm -hmm. to present yourself properly, okay? Mm -hmm. This is, this is, these are really synonymous in one another. Um, and then, then we're bottling. Now we're, we're going back to this bottling thing. And, um, you know, it's, it's really about, you know, cleanliness and, and preparation and, um, and, and really understanding what this is, this is the last opportunity. So, so we put a lot of energy into our bottles, you know, um, in picking the color of the glass. We put a lot of energy in the graphics of our, of our label and making sure it really represents what's inside the bottle. Um, you know, this is kind of like, um, um, 
your, you know, you're filling out your college application and writing your, your personal statement or getting your letters of recommendations from your, your, your favorite teachers. You know, we, what we do, what we do in the winery is it's called a bottling review. And literally we will open. So, so for instance, for Richie Vineyard, when we, just before we bottle that, reopen up a bottle of every single vintage that we produce. So starting with 2002, we have an 02, 03, 04, 05, and so on. And we'll open them all up, we'll pour a glass, and we'll, we'll taste every single one of these wines to see how they're developing. You know, the history really helps kind of predict where you're good headed. So again, you know, you're doing research, you're looking at what, where you've been, you're looking at your colleges, you're looking at your, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? So, so there's an interesting similarity there. And then, and then at the end of the day, you put a cork in the bottle. Okay. So uh, I'll tell you, this is, this is a kind of a revolutionary kind of um, experience for me and, and David is, is the cork. And um, uh, Reeve started testing. You, you guys opened it up. You have this, the DM cork. DM, it's a French company. DM is, a, uh, is short for Diamante, means diamond in French. And what they have, um, they've created is a closure or a cork that is another tool, very powerful tool for winemakers to use to essentially um, uh, regulate how the wine performs after it's in the bottle. Before, we really didn't have much, uh, didn't really have much control. And the reason why, I want you to, I want to make sure you guys see this visual aid. This is a cork bark, okay? This is cork. And this basically comes off the tree and then they plug corks out of it, okay? So if you look close enough, you can see all these growth rings. And there is, you can't tell me that every one of these corks are a little bit different. So the beauty of the, the DM cork is every single cork is the same. They do is they take the cork, they grind it up, and they treat it with um, critical CO2 and put it back together in a, in a structure that allows a known and regulated and chosen, chosen level of OTR, that's oxygen transfer rate. It's the amount of oxygen that can come from the atmosphere into the wine. Now we've, we've determined we've done a lot of a lot of studies and we've determined that uh, 0.3 milligrams per year is the perfect amount of, for wine and um, that known is so so comforting because because what happens with the raw cork is it could range from 0.3 to you know 1.3 mm -hmm. and that's the difference between a wine that is fresh and fruity and the wine is completely oxidized. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what happens is, here's a scenario. So I'm at a wine dinner, right? I'm, I'm doing a wine dinner with a bunch of people and we, uh, we get a wine and it's either, cor it's a, oh, I haven't even talked about TCA yet. I'll get there in a minute. Uh, it was, obviously, the, the, the OTR is actually more important to me than the TCA. And I'll tell you why. Because say so you're at this dinner and you're hosting a party and you open up your, your flagship bottle, of, you know, Cabernet for $200 a bottle. And it's corked, or it's just really oxidized. Well, then you got to talk about the the fact that cork is a product of nature, and you know, various uh, some corks vary from others to the other, and and TCA is a natural occurring you know phenomenon with the mold and the chlorine. It just it's in the air. We we don't have it have as much controls or as, as we want to, and everybody's okay with that story. But now I just spent like five minutes of my precious time talking about the issues with raw cork when I could be talking about the wine or someone else's, you know, whatever else somebody else to talk about or oak, but now I don't have to talk about it. I mean, I am talking about DM until we all get on board and start using DM, but, uh, but no, this is, this is a nice tool. It's a great tool. Um, it's, in, it's interesting to me 
Cameron, you know, if I can just take us back to our life metaphor, you know, you spend all this time and effort and as your children do in uh, getting themselves ready and all that, and you're, you're about to send them off into the real world. And yet you are, if you're, if you're a traditional producer, let's say you use punch cork and you know, a lot of people use punch cork and punch cork varies in quality, uh, I might add too. And you can tell that um, very quickly in tasting through a lot of wine, you know, at, at Mass of the World, we'll sit around and taste, I don't know, 10, 15 cases of something at the same time. And with punch cork, you can see, number one, obviously you have to pay hypertension to corkiness, but you note incredible, to your point, levels of variability based on the o OTR, the, as you said, changing from bottle to bottle. So I, I, I laugh and my, my team rolls their eyes um, when I say this, that when you open a case of wine, it's not a case of wine, it's 12 different wines because you can literally notice the differences there. And from a consistency standpoint um, and a predictability standpoint and knowing that for all this hard work that you've done, all of this effort that you've done, that you're putting it at the risk of a little piece of tree bark would scare the living daylights out of me. You know, that would, that's kind of like, you know, you're, you think you've done well, but you've only been a helicopter parent, right? You, you have to do that. So, so I, I think that you're, um, you're saying this is also important in the real world and also from the standpoint of what you do, the amount of time that you're not talking about the wine because you're having to explain all this other things takes your entire conversation and throws you sideways, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's something I've really uh, noticed um, that has changed, you know, when I'm, when I'm hosting dinners or, or, or events, uh, you know, I never have to worry about, I don't have to worry anymore. I just yeah. pull the cork and, and it's go time. So, so yeah, I think the metaphor, I mean, is like the cork you choose is kind of like, I don't know, maybe, maybe the, the college or the, maybe the, the academic route you take that is going to develop your vision as a, as a older adult. And then the, and then the OTR is kind of like the, uh, it's like your college fund. It's like your 529C. It's like, <laughs> you know, that just keeps kind of helping fund your, my kids are literally going, they're about, we're picking colleges this month, actually. Cal mm -hmm. State applications are due in uh, like 10 days. So mm -hmm. I'm right in the middle of this. So yeah, I mean, the OTR is like funding. That's just keeps something, keeps helping, keeps giving for a while. Absolutely. And then and eventually it has an impact on how much debt they're going to have when they get out of school. So we're, we're going to get there in a second. Um, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, the importance of um, just quickly, because I know we have a couple of other things and I do want to have ample time for Q&A, but let's talk a little bit about resting. You know, you, you talked about how, how the, tra the trauma of bottling is um, for a wine. How critical is it and how underappreciated uh, is it to give a wine after it's been finished, closed, sealed, that time to relax and refine itself before you send it out into the real world? Yeah, this is a good question. And so, you know, I actually think it depends on the end user, on the consumer. It depends mm. on uh, who's gonna open the cork, who's gonna pull the cork out. Because for me, I really like to um, pick a wine apart. I really like to kind of figure out the, the appellation. I wanna know how much oak the winemaker used i kind of want to i kind of want to be able to you know understand how the wine was made and so i tend to like my wines a little bit younger mm -hmm. um people are always how long she aged these wines oh it depends but but as these wine as wines are laid down and rest they, they they become more all these attributes become more homogenized they become more integrated the wine definitely changes into a more mature more sophisticated wine, but you can't pick out all these little, you won't be able to pick out as much all these little nuances and try to say, oh, that's Gigandaz or that's California Syrah or, or Chateauneuf. You can't really, you know, you, it's, it's, it becomes more and more difficult to really the, to, the, to pick it apart as the wines get older, but, but there's some really beauty to, to allowing wines to kind of grow up into, you know, into a second growth or a second beginning, so to speak. So. So it depends on whoever's pulling the cork, yeah, how absolutely. long you want to age. Okay, well let's let's uh, let's 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 take ourselves out now. And you're you know you're out of college and you're you're on your own and you're doing that. And you know to you know when I get older, many years from now, will you still be sending me a Valentine birthday greetings? 
bottle of wine. So now your wine is out, it's in the market. I think as a, as a, as a parent, you would say your kid's out there on your own, you know, used to worry uh, at two in the morning if they weren't home. Now you don't even know if they're home at two in the morning or not what you're doing. So many things are out of your control when the wine is out there in the world, when it's left, when you wave goodbye, you get back on the plane, you burst into tears, boom, boom, boom. But the wine is there, it's in many respects, it's beginning its journey there. Um, and where there's a lot of things that are out of your control, I'd like you to talk about that. And then I'd like you to talk about, you know, again, you, we, we talked about vaccinations at the beginning, um, preventative care. It, and, and to your point, I want you to come back to this choice of closure thing, because at least that's one thing you, you can worry less about. How does the uh, maturity and the out in the real world thing touch? Well, we have, we kind of have, uh, we have extended caretakers out in the, out in the market, so to speak. So our wines are, are shipped in all 50 states and now about 28 countries and, and we travel. I travel. I, I, I'm going to Virginia in two weeks to go to the Chesapeake Wine Festival. And, um, you know, the whole deal there is to, to not only visit our, our, our distributors and work with our, our um, we have people that, Ramey employees that are nas our national, national team, but, um, but also to talk with people that are, I can't, I don't get to see here in California. Cause the, I mean, yeah, a lot, we do get a lot of people from various parts of the world here, but, but it's much easier for me uh, to go meet with people and get sort of reflection from them on how I'm, how I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know, how my kids are doing. Are they, are they, are they, are they still hanging out with them? Are they behaving? Are they doing what <laughs> I intended them to do? And so I think it's really important for winemakers to get out and um, and travel and 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 and, and see and um, see see people and meet with others that are are, are drinking wine. So um, you know the restaurant industry is a whole another uh, is like is like a secondary school. That's where the PhDs happen, right? You go to you know you're going to like um, Jean George down in down in Manhattan or you're going in, you're in Chicago, you're at these great, you know, Michelin star restaurants. That's like your, your wines, if, if they're there, they've grown up. Now they're, now they're doing their internship is they're going to be doctors at some point, or they already are there. So, so those, you get into those situations there and you see your wines performing properly. Um, it's a good uh, litmus. It's a good uh, reflection that you're doing a great job. Occasionally a wine consumer, may feel like your wine's misbehaving. And um, yeah, sometimes some wines get, you know, they'll show it, they'll come back. And and basically it just takes a little bit of a conversation with the two to figure out what happened. Maybe it shipped, in a, it's got a little alarm it was shipped, or maybe maybe there is something funky with, um, um, I don't know, there's a, there, there's a few, there's, there's things that happen that mm -hmm. just are unexplainable, you know, and so, so that's when you go to therapy, right? You got to talk to your, <laughs> you got to talk to them and say, I'm sorry, we'll send you another case. And so you work through it. Right. But um, yeah, it's all about communication, talking and, and really learning about whether or not you're doing the right thing. Seeing, seeing who they're, as young adults, who they're hanging out with, meeting their friends, yes. conversing about your friends to them, not objectively without them in the rooms. So they know how they're, you know, you know how they're doing, they're more objective. But I, I, I do think, you know, and, and, and obviously as a caring um, winemaker, you know, these choices that you've made early on throughout the life of the wine, from the picking to the élevage, through all of that, you're doing as much to set yourself up, uh, set your children up for success as much as possible. And, and I, I do think that um, that choice of closure we talked about again is, you know, at least again, one thing you've got control over. And, and like I said uh, before, and I'll close on, on this one before we open it up to questions and I see we've got questions, is that um, there's, there's so much you do there for, 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 the, for a winery, this can be a decision um, that, it, that can cost a quarter, it could cost a couple of dollars, but the amount of control over the ultimate destiny of, the, of, of this wine, um, you're going to probably sleep a lot better knowing that you have to think less about the variation and less about the possibility of, of TCA, which is, you know, a time bomb for everybody. So, so many things along there, but the vaccinations that we can do are all great. So, 
Um, yeah. Before I open it up to everybody else, any any closing thoughts, words of wisdom uh, as a parent, as a winemaker, things that we don't think about that perhaps we should, and then we'll take some questions. I would say uh, plan your work, work your plan, and take it one day at a time. There you go. There you go. With that, um, we're going to move into, I mean, in the end, all we really want to do to finish it with some music is shiny, happy people. We want shiny, happy people uh, out there. So Li Meng, um, th thank you for laughing, Cameron. Uh, we, uh, this has been a lovely, uh, I love least, I've had a tremendous amount of fun chatting with Cameron. And I, I hope it's been a very provocative dialogue uh, out there in chat land and question land. So um, do we have some questions? Can we throw it out? Can, can we, we have plenty of questions. So uh, Cameron, these are gonna be quick hits that I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out there. Um, yes. Here's a question from Chris, just going back to winemaking, I'm just gonna, um, I'm not doing it by order, I'm doing it by sort of like where it is in the process. Um, so Cameron, on the natural, uh, on ML, on Mallow, are you doing it natural or are you pitching a culture? This is a question from Chris. Yeah, it's natural, I haven't bought a, I haven't bought a kilo in yeast in 25 years. Everything comes from the vineyard, as well as malactic. It's uh, it's 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 in it's in from, from the vineyard or it's in the in the winery. Great, yeah, wonderful. Um, another question here on SO2. Um, you mentioned adding SO2. How much sulfur is enough, and how do you decide? Do you decide by variety? Do you decide decide by pH? So, so yeah, this is good for like especially if you're a home winemaker. But with Chardonnay. You want 40 parts per million total. This is this is such a tiny, tiny amount. With the uh, red grapes, you want 60 parts per uh, 60 parts per million total. This is at the beginning when the wines are just being made. Um, this is the most important add in order to create a healthy fermentation environment. And I'll tell you, if you look at um, a lot of the dried fruit uh, and other uh, produce that we're eating, there's we, we've done measurements like dried apricots. They're like thousands and th there are thousands of parts higher than what is in wine so it doesn't take much it's literally just you know parts per million it just takes a tiny bit to keep all the the bacteria and the and all the collector all the the, the the yeast that we don't want to get involved with this fermentation keep those guys in check great um besides malolactic fermentation a question here from becky what else can be done to stabilize wines um, so, okay. Yeah. I mean, the other, there's one other option and you buy a filter. You don't want your wine to go through malactic. You have to put it through a filter. Um, that's the, that's the safest part. And, and yeah. So if you're making things like, like Sauvignon Blanc, if you're making wines like that have any, any kind of, uh, I, I call them the one, the one, uh, the one bottle wine. So for instance, you go to a bottle, go to a, a, a restaurant and, and you order a bottle of Albarino or Verdejo or Sauv Blanc. You order one bottle, right? You don't you don't go second Albarino. You might go Chardonnay. You can order two bottles of Chardonnay, but but generally it's like these white varieties that that you're not going to find your cellar for years. Those are the ones that um, that uh, that are usually they're they're filtering actually kind of helps clarify and bring out the fruit, but also will stabilize the wine and, and removes all those potential bacteria that might push it through malactic. Great. Here's a great question from Wilfred. When I first tried Remy Chardonnay's, I noticed how cloudy and full of fine particles. And while that never bothered me, did you ever get pushback from the marketplace? Uh, no, no pushback. I think, you know, sometimes this is, this is back when you go back to child rearing, you know, some, some kids are a little bit more, um, uh, I don't know, maybe they're a little more challenging than, 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 than others. And so clarification is vintage dependent. Sometimes clear, getting that perfect clarity um, doesn't happen to the, to the level that I like. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you're okay with that because if I were to go any other way, for instance, filtering, I think you would be, um, you'd be much less happy. <laughs> 
Yeah. And as we're talking here, um, Andrea is also going to put people in as panelists if uh, people want to actually be seen and ask your questions live. So if you get an invitation to be a panelist or to talk, if you want to, uh, please feel free to speak up. I'm going to keep throwing out these questions here so we can hit the, the greatest hits here. Cameron, on screw caps versus DM. Any thoughts on using screw caps so that you have a completely controlled OTR? Is that is that a good assumption? I, I think, you know, I mean, I'll tell you what, one of the parts, we've looked at screw caps and um, there's a logistic challenge to screw caps. When, I mean, switching to the, the DM cork from a, a, a you know, the, the raw cork, it's a, it's a, it's just a choice. There's no logistical, um, uh, change and what I mean by that is you you got to completely reconfigure your body line you got to completely change your bottle mold the capsule it's a whole nother another world um, as far as the wine quality goes you know I don't um, re, you gotta we gotta test things you know how am I gonna test um, screw caps when I don't even have the logistics to, to make it happen. We started testing the DM closure in 2005. That was our first uh, um, time we put it up on, on in a bottle on wine. And we didn't, it took us almost, I want to say 10, 12, 12, 13, I think was our first vintage. So it took us almost five, six, seven years to fully implement the DM cork. And, and what I mean by that is we reanalyzed the wines, we tested the wines, we, we had the capability to not only do it, you know, you know, logistically, but sensory as wise too. So it's just, you know, the screw cap, it's, we're not quite ready for that yet. Great. Um, here's a question from Nicole. What is the recommended temperature for this particular Chardonnay, this Vichy Chardonnay? Um, it was really opening up as it warmed up from her fridge temperature. What is your recommended temperature? Yeah, I like, I usually, I keep my cellar at home around 57 to maybe 60 degrees in the summertime when the, when it gets a little warm. And I, that's that's the temperature I like to drink them at. And and yeah, I think it's sort of, it's kind of fun to drink them um, a little bit cooler. Definitely refrigerator, bring them out and let them warm up for, I'd say, 15, 20 minutes or so. But I, I, I say pull them at at your lower cellar temperature, like 55 degrees, and then let them come up to the room temperature. I mean, honestly, I love tasting our wines at like 68 sometimes if it's if it's like a winter day like it is now. I think that's when they, they really show everything, the fruit, the oak, the texture, the aromatics that come to life. I, I mean, that might be a little warm for some, but that's, that's kind of my opinion. Great, here's a tough one. Of course, it's from Jeff. I love it. There, there have been times where I've been proud of my children, but also times, frankly, when I've been rather embarrassed by them. Have you experienced both ends of the spectrum with your wines? And you've got an upvote from Nicole on that question. To embarrassed from my by my wines? Uh, okay, so getting real here, Cameron. <laughs> so here's the deal. Here's what happens. Uh, oh, I've been fully embarrassed. And usually what happens is you're in a blind tasting with uh, 12 other winemakers and uh, you, <laughs> you're ranking these wines and you're just one wine, you particularly just dislike it. And you start talking about how, how much oak there is and how, how tannic it is. And it's just start panning it. And then they pull the bag off the label and it's your wine. So that's a tough one to swallow. You got to like somehow spin that. And I know, I think a lot of winemakers, they're good at spinning things, but that one, you just want to crawl under the table and pop. But yeah, that's, those are, and, those and are both, Yeah, both Evan and I have been there when, when not you, but David <laughs> stepped yeah. into that. He's done, I've seen, yeah, he's done it too. We all have done it. We've all, done yeah. it. We've all done it. And who knows, who knows why it is, you know, maybe it's a temperature thing or maybe, Maybe it's relative and relative to the other wines you're tasting. 
you know. Yeah, well, all, I so, also think I also think Cameron, you know, we, the same wine on two different days. You know, who we are, we change our yeah. mood, what you arrive at. I, you know, I don't want to go so crazy to say is it a fruit day, is it an Earth Day, or whatever. But nevertheless, you know, I I found that that you know even when I when I I'll write a tasting note or something, I'm always well aware that that's how that wine is tasting to me on that given day. And it's literally a snapshot in time. And it's, you know, it's, it's happened to all of us, to your point, you can have those days where you feel like you can't taste your way out of a paper bag and days where you feel like everything is just spinning beautifully. I see Wilfred nodding. I mean, yeah. yeah. So I have, I have a question that's a combo between what Jeff is asking and what Chris is asking, and it's about what you've learned. So as a young parent, you know, you may have learned a lot from what to do and what not to do. You know, who are your peers that taught you valuable lessons that may not be found in a book? And then the side note to that question from Chris is after 30 years of winemaking, what do you wish you knew your very first year um, that you know now? Oh, wow. Profound. Well, you know, they say the best parents to raise your children are your your own parents. So my mother and father, I, 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 I thank them because they're my uh, they have been my resource for uh, not only like uh, academic and, um, and but also just experiences. Um, and honestly, I'll tell you, <laughs> David has kind of been a father to me as well. David Ramey is definitely a mentor and he's been making wine for, um, I think Ever. we did math, <laughs> I don't know, 50 years or something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so yeah, he definitely has been a mentor as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think what, it's my first year of winemaking. Hmm. Gosh, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I feel like, not, you know, it's, I guess it started with, with sort of just listening more and being, um, and nudging your way into people's lives that may have been too busy to uh, allow you to get involved with, you know, hanging out in the tasting room or, or hanging out in, you know, and bugging wine, other winemakers and, and asking them, um, as many questions as possible. And, you know, to, to find those opportunities that um, will help you kind of answer more questions faster. You know, the, the, thing about, the thing about being a winemaker is nobody really listens to you until you're older. And so, and so it's like, yeah, I mean, think about it. Think about any young winemakers that are, you know, I mean, even me, I'm kind of young to be considered a, you know, you got to be like 65 or something, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a weird phenomenon, but, but I think it comes with experience and knowledge. I think that's why people really, um, people really appreciate um, great winemakers because they have this whole wisdom, you know, you know, that the thing about, about going to college and learning winemaking is that the, the school doesn't teach you how to make great wine. It teaches you how to not make bad wine. OK, you learn how to make good wine by by doing it by year, after year after year, then essentially you'll learn how to be a good winemaker. But, yeah, you can take a graduate out of Davis or, you know, or, or Fresno or Cornell or, you know, and drop in the middle of a winery. And you're pretty, pretty, pretty much guaranteed it's not going to make vinegar, but, it's, you know, it's going to turn out pretty good. It's going to turn out OK. You're going to be able to bottle it. But. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect any, anything over a 90 in the wine spectator. You know, it's interesting if I could just jump in here and I'm, you know, I'm thinking the parallels in cooking, you know, and, and, and um, not to denigrate any of the um, institutions out there who churn out um, amazing um, talent. But, you know, schools are really good for showing you how to make an ice sculpture, right? Showing you how to take apart a cow in five minutes and show you how to make a mother sauce by the books. But so much of your learning is then going and apprenticing with, with other chefs, finding somebody who you respect tremendously and asking them to your point, Cameron, lots of questions along the way. And there's a huge difference between um, the, the academic and logistical steps of winemaking or of cooking and then real life and the lessons you learn, the mistakes you make along the way and saying, I'm not going to do that again, or my sauce broke or this fermentation didn't finish or, or what it is. And I think that's a really appropriate analogy that you bring up and one that's well taken. 
Yeah, All right, we've got um, two questions here. One back to fermentation. During fermentation, when you're doing that smell test that you're talking about, how would you describe uh, the smell or smells that recommend that the wine needs a diaper change? <laughs> so yeah, so okay, I'll, I'll, let me walk you through. Let me give you the executive summary. So when you're using natural yeast, uh, so what happens is you get a kind of a, a flora on top. And it's usually like, it's, it's these yeast cholecora and some other ones that really love oxygen. And basically those are the yeast that actually make vinegar. Okay, so you get, or they're involved in that. So you will get a little bit of that fingernail, that ethyl acetate kind of character, finger, fingernail polish. Um, and that's when you know you need to do a pump over. So you need to start bringing fresh juice in and creating sort of a more um, anaerobic environment. So that's, that's usually in the first, three days, okay, or four days. And the other thing I'll do is I'll look at temperature. If the temperature is too cold, because a lot of vineyards, a lot of uh, growers will bring their fruit in, they'll pick at night and the fruit comes in really cold. I'll, I'll warm it up. I'll bring it up to like 65 degrees, maybe 68 degrees and do that pump over. And then by, but usually that, usually what happens within five days total, so another couple of days, then CO2 starts coming out. The wine smells fresh, it's healthy. Um, then you know you're, you're, you're safe. Now, as you progress further through the fermentation, um, there's certain varieties you gotta pay attention to. Uh, in particular, Syrah. Syrah has a certain tendency to get a little, we call reduced. And so that means the yeast are starving for oxygen. And that's when you, that's when the smell test is probably even more important because if you don't address it right away, you, there's no backtracking because once that reduction compound starts uh, uh, solubilizing and, and configuring into something that can't go back out just by flashing the wine, you, you've lost your opportunity. So if you smell the wine and you smell, literally some people say it, it smells a little like a, almost like a, not quite like a, like a sulfide burnt egg, but kind of that musty, musty character. Um, that's when you say, okay, we're going to splash the wine really real. Instead of just pumping from the bottom valve over the top, Real, real dump, the wine will splash into a sump, big sump with a screen and some a lot of air will get incorporated and it gets pumped back over the top and gets a gentle little sprinkler right uh, right over the top of the, of the what's called the cap. So yeah, that's when the air goes in. So yeah. those are two, those two big port, uh, points when you want to do your smell test and, and intervene. Nobody sure wants get, get dirty diapers, diaper. yeah. <laughs> I gotta say, Cameron, you said at one point, moving that wine into bottles is a very treacherous state, but I just feel like every step of winemaking feels like a treacherous state of some sort. So it's, it's incredible how much goes into winemaking. And we just drink the bottle and we think, oh yeah, here it is. Um, I love these questions for Jill and I want to make sure that we get these answered. So the DM cork is totally proven to be 0% cork taint. Before you answer that question, and before uh, Yoan, who is from DM, is also in the room if you want to jump in, um, I just want to say Evan and I and Becky literally do cartwheels when we realize that the wine that we are about to rebottle for Master of the World is DM closed. Because then we don't have to worry about all the variability that comes with every single bottle. And literally on Monday, we were tasting 17 cases, guys, on the production line, two psalms have to sign off on every single bottle of a naturally closed uh, court, uh, punch court wine because of all the things that uh, uh, Cameron's talking about. So Cameron, Jill's question, is DM totally proven to be 0% court taint? Yes, it's zero. Re, and, and I'll tell you, we make about 30, 30, 35,000 cases a year since 2013 uh, all over the world. I have yet, to get one bottle returned because of cork taint. I have yet to open one bottle personally uh, that ha ha has cork taint. I, I, I haven't, I don't, when we have tastings, when our, when our, when for people come here, we don't taste any, we don't pre-taste anything. We open the cork, we pour the wine. That's our SOP. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's proof in the pudding. Now, now maybe, maybe Francois says, oh, there's a 0 0.0001 chance. I don't, you know I, that 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 might be the case. I'll let him him work on that. But you know, it's it's this method is nothing new. It's been around for for you know it's the same process they use to decaffeinate coffee. It's it's the, the high, 
the critical CO2. It's uh, it, it it works. It it cleans. It removes all these um, these issues. So, um, you know, there's the human error. I guess if somebody thinks they smell corked wine, then you know now we're in a gray area that is is really hard. But but I would if somebody if I would love to have that come back to me and I could test it. We have ways to test TCA so I can determine whether or not it's in that cork or in that wine. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I also want to say Jeff asked if Evan would demonstrate how to do a cartwheel, uh, literally doing cartwheels. We did, Jeff, put Evan through aerial yoga uh, in August at our, our own company retreat. So Not pretty. that's Not close pretty. enough to a cartwheel. Um, going back to the cork, uh, another follow-up question from Jill and perhaps uh, Cameron, for you guys to decide, back when in 2005, did you consider other composites? Because Jill says here, we thought that anything made from cork, even composite cork, could have a percentage of TCA possible. So what is it about the DM that makes it the, the composite nature of that not um, have TCA? Well, yes. We, first of all, we were trying, I mean, we were trying everything. We were trying everything from plastic corks to other synthetic corks. We were trying corks from, from like five other suppliers. And there were so many really new sort of approaches to minimizing TCA. No one really was saying they're gonna get rid of it. Um, but there was, and there's still a lot of, of work, a lot of people are working really hard at, at minimizing TCA, but, but you know, at 0.2%, at I, I still can't, it's not acceptable. One bottle is not acceptable, it's just not right. And so um, at the time, uh, DM, they had the only, they had the patent. They had this, the, 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 the patented methodology of using hypercritical CO2 and, to remove any, all the impurities from the cork. So nobody else was doing it. And, um, you know, we got a hold of it and we were basically treating it like any other cork. We, just, we, uh, we had no, oh, I lost, I lost somebody. Anyways, can you see me? You can see yes, me. yes, we see you. Okay. Um, we had no idea what we were, what was going to happen. You know, we, we, we had just as high hopes for DM as we did all the other agglomerated corks. We were, we did, we were trying other agglomerated corks that were, were claiming to have addressed the TCA problem. Um, now honestly, we weren't even thinking about OTR. We weren't even thinking about consistency. We were just more concerned about TCA because there was so much corked wine out in the market. That was what we were really looking at. But then later on, after we learned about the, the, the vanishing TCA, we learned like, oh, every cork's the same and we can control the OTR to our specification. Great. Um, and just to clarify from Tracy here um, about the cork, is the DM product TCA resistant and can the closure become tainted after production? We're not talking about the cork being TCA resistant. Maybe we need to explain a little bit how the cork becomes uh, TCA free. Yeah, I, yeah, it's a hyper. I mean, you know, might have to lean on Francois for this one. Or I Johan, don't. Johan. Oh, Johan. Johan. Oh, Johan's here. Sorry. Oh, great. We got <laughs> the real McCoy then. Okay. Uh, I don't think that it's TCA resistant, but once the cork is in the bottle and the capsule is 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 is, is sealed the the the, the cork. It's virtually impossible. Now, now you know, TCA can happen in wine before it's bottled. Don't forget about that. Mold, this, the, the, the compound that creates TCA can occur in the winery before the cork even gets to the winery. So that's why we, all the water that enters this winery is filtered. All the water is dechlorinated and every little mold spore that possibly could grow on on any kind of like pallet or cardboard is is gone. You don't you don't you shouldn't see any cardboard or pallets in or wooden pallets in a winery any longer. There'll be plastic pallets, and the cardboard is always you know uh, stored in an offsite area. Um, so so we we removed the possible possibility of happening in, in winery at the, in the wine, but it could happen in the wine before you know before it goes in the bottle, which should be you know very tragic. Johan, do you want to explain that, that it's not TCA resistant? Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so DM corks are guaranteed free of TCA and 150 molecules. 
but we are not TCL resistant. If there is an aerobic contamination during the shipping or in the cellar or at the customer house, it will not be resistant. The cork will be tainted on the top. So we have already seen that in the past, but the, the cork is not resistant. It will be free of TCA at delivery. So it's due to our process. So Cameron said it well, it's supercritical CO2 that will extract all the, the volatiles inside the cork and make it free, free of TCA. And I'd like to add something that Cameron started to say. It's the wine industry is the only food industry that accepts that the packaging might affect the product. We are the only food industry that accepts that now. And that's why DIAM was created 20 years ago. We are still speaking about TCA, but now the topic is more about aging wine in bottle. And Cameron does that well at Remy. Mm -hmm. And Cameron, here's a follow-up question about uh, the TCA and the cork. Does, does this mean that because contamination can happen outside that um, DM specifically needs to be used with capsules? Um, no, I, I don't, I don't, I think, I feel like, I mean, I, there's probably no research to back this up, but you have a, you have a cork that's two inches long and I, you know, with the binder and the, the granular granularity of the cork, um, I don't feel like, and I haven't heard of any kind of, you know, contamination happening from the exterior into the wine. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's pretty hard pressed. I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I can't, I can't substantiate that in, in any way or not. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving from the court for a little bit here, um, here's a question from Tracy. I work with curious consumers who come to the subject with random ideas about wine and the limited amount of energy to spend trying to understand winemaking. What are some of the things that you'd like them to know about what you do to try to supply them with authentic, delicious wines? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's just grape juice crying out loud, you know, come on. Um, I think, I think don't be afraid to try something new for starters. Don't be afraid to look in that section of the wine list that says other, because you'll find some, some really cool diamonds in that rough. Um, you know, and the, the only thing you might want to just pay attention to is, is you might want to read, you know, you know, a certain, you know, information about who, what wineries are doing what. And, um, and, and make sure you're, 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 you're choosing wineries that have some kind of a, a little bit of a reputation, you know, it's something that you can trust, I guess. Um, but I, I, but once in a while, you gotta, you gotta get, you, you fall off the rails and I do it. Sometimes I'll, I'll look at something that I, I know I shouldn't be trying, but, and, and typically it, I shouldn't, but occasionally it's like, wow, that is brilliant. That is so good. So. So I don't know, try something new, but then don't be afraid of failure because it happens. Even I, like I said, I, I, I've spent way too much money on wines that I shouldn't have spent on. And, um, but and it, you just gotta accept that, but keep trying. Don't, get, don't, don't stop because you're afraid. I love this last question for you. Uh, and then Evan, I'll let you close um, from Timothy O'Brien. Cameron, looking at the camera, are you a helicopter winemaker? <laughs> yeah, you should go ask my employees out there. They definitely, they definitely are. Uh, I just had had my guy doing pump overs. He says, "Do you mind leaving? I've, I've got work to do." I'm definitely uh, out there. I and I'll tell them that once in a while I have to micromanage because that's just the nature of who I am. So yeah, but at least I know I am. I know I'm a helicopter winemaker. <laughs> Right. Recognition of the problem is 50%, right? Yes. That, that you have it. Um, well, thank you. And, and by the way, uh, first of all, Cameron, thank you so much for taking the time out of a busy schedule at a busy time of year uh, to be with us. And just so that you know, David uh, is not here with us today because he is celebrating, is it his 31st wedding anniversary with Anne? Yeah, 
he's 70 years old. So that sounds about right. Up, yeah. So he's, yeah. he's actually <laughs> doing something very important too. Not that this isn't important, but that's even more important. Yeah. Uh, but thank you for, for that. And thank you for uh, bringing us into your world, sharing uh, your philosophies. I, I walked out of here learning stuff about winemaking that I didn't even know, um, which is, yeah. which is, uh, I guess that happens a lot, but, but nevertheless, um, and this has been a, a lovely seminar. Like I said, we threw this out there thinking that it would be an interesting thing, hoping that the, the, the metaphor of parenting and winemaking would be one that was a germane. It looks like we did strike a chord uh, with everybody. That's, that's great. And, um, in closing, also just thank you uh, to the to the folks over at uh, at uh, DM uh, for supporting this uh, this this uh, seminar as well too at G three. Um, thanks to all of you for taking the time out there. I think we have one session left, Lee Mang. Is that what's uh, there before we um, we close up today? To, uh, for tomorrow. tomorrow. So yeah. yeah, tomorrow at ten o'clock. And I I do want to say that props to a client um uh, dm and g3 who gave evan and i free reign to run this seminar and uh when when i first called david i think two months ago and said uh can we buy some wine from you and you know just have a conversation and you don't need to talk about dm they're like no we want to this is this is a part of the process so it takes a very bold and secure client to feel so like they can trust us with just just find somebody who uses our product and let them talk about their wines. And I, I think that is kudos to both G3 and DM for the amazing trust uh, they have in their product and in the wineries who use them. Great. And hopefully everybody out there, whether you're a parent or simply were parented, uh, you found the analogies uh, appropriate and all of that. Think about that. It's a, Parenting is a soft science. Making wine to a degree is a soft science as well too in interpretation and things like that. And um, yeah, I, I found the hour, the 90 minutes just raced by. I hope you did too. And I hope you walked out more importantly with more than you walked in. With. Hope to see you at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you, Cameron, again. Thank you, yep. everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you.